Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. In his bestseller, Intruders, Bud Hopkins chronicled the lives of one Indiana family who were being victimized by what they believed were extraterrestrial invaders. The book used pseudonyms, and when a movie was made about the beleaguered family, actors portrayed them. But now, after more than a decade, the real families agreed to come forward. Here are their first-person accounts of life with the intruders. On a warm Indian summer evening, on the porch of their Indianapolis home, the Whites share a family meal. A passerby might mistake them for a typical Midwestern family, unless, of course, they'd read this book, detailing the Whites' personal history of alien abduction. There was more evidence supporting this uh, abduction than any in so far investigated the history of, of uh, the science of the comparative study of abduction, uh, the abduction phenomenon. This is the first case that let us understand the alien's purpose. The family's incredible story first came to Bud Hopkins' attention in 1983. The White's middle daughter, Debbie, wrote Hopkins a letter explaining her fear and frustration and included these photographs of strange burn marks which were appearing in the White's backyard. The grass looked like it had been compacted. There was no grass alive on it. That in itself really ticked me off because I thought my yard was nice. It was one day nice, next day no. And there it is, and it stayed like that for almost five years. Hopkins had received many letters from self-proclaimed abductees, but none had the wealth of experience and the mysterious physical evidence present in the White case. This is what happened to the nice, rich, loamy, uh, black-brown soil that uh, the backyard in Indiana had. It was turned sort of gray and, and hard as a rock. So we don't know what it is that caused this effect, but it has turned up in numerous other UFO landing cases in other parts of the world. When I got out there when I, and, and when I learned through a few phone calls, um, the neighbors had witnessed uh, certain uh, manifestations that very night. Uh, there was this tremendous noise coming from Debbie's yard and this huge flash of light through, coming through the trees and all the electricity went out. So we had a lot of people who could say, no, this is not something that went on in, in some young woman's head. This is something that went on outside the house, in the backyard. During that UFO encounter, Debbie had a period of missing time she could not account for. But under hypnosis, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. We proceeded to do a hypnotic regression. And uh, the story began to slowly unfold of what had happened in the period of time she couldn't recall. Things started coming out of me. Memories started coming back from all over the place. It was like this a floodgate opened up. During that session, Debbie recalled the terrifying events that preceded the mysterious burn marks on the lawn. Night that changed my life forever. I uh, happened to see a really strange light coming out of the pump house that's next to the swimming pool out back. I was thinking of prowlers, you know. And by the time I got back there in just maybe five minutes, it was gone. When the lights disappeared, Debbie asked her mother to babysit while Debbie went over to a girlfriend's house. Later that night, from the doorway, Debbie's mother began to see the lights as well. As I looked out the window on the bird feeder, I seen the, a light that was about the size of a basketball. And I got on the phone and I called Debbie because I was here with the two, two little ones by myself. So I hung up the phone. I said, I got to go home. There's something going on. She come in the back door and she said, where's dad's shotgun? And Debbie picked up the gun, went out in the back. And I watched her out the back door and she came to the bump house and she opened the door. I don't remember seeing a darn thing. Found my dog hiding under my dad's truck out back and tried with all my might to get her out from under the truck. And she would not come. She was screaming and squealing. I grabbed her paws and tried to drag her, and she wouldn't come. When Debbie walked back toward the house, she saw a ball of light inside the garage. Her mother was standing, frozen, at the screen door. Sometimes when a person is being abducted, the other people are switched off as we call it there, sort of in a state of suspended animation. 
all of a sudden, I feel like my whole body is on fire. Every inch of my skin is burning. And I realized I couldn't move. And I also could hardly see. It was like I'd been attacked by a mob of tourists with cameras flashing me in the eyes. Then I could see this movement in the yard in front of me, and there were six small people. I could see these big black eyes. Ooh, and I got the shivers, you know? And I'm thinking, no, this can't be. Then I can move again. It's like I blinked and all this stuff was gone. Later, we figured out I was gone in like an hour and a half. And I don't remember like 10 minutes. For months after the incident, Debbie suffered from fatigue, headache, and flu-like symptoms. The family dog died soon after the encounter from what the vet described as an illness resembling radiation poisoning. When Bud Hopkins met the family later, he administered psychological and physical tests and determined that the whites were of sound mind and body. He then began his three-year study of their abduction experiences. It would seem that the mother had had uh, childhood abduction experiences and that Debbie's sister had also had experiences as a child. Um, this is what the, the um, hypnotic sessions revealed. Uh, of course, her mother having this very deep scoop mark in the front of her leg, more or less in exactly the same place as Debbie's is. So there was a lot of reason to believe that uh, the family was associated with, the, with an abduction. Debbie's older sister, Kathy, recalled an extraordinary UFO encounter she had as a teenager in 1965. My mom had me take her uh, to a church function. It was approximately 4.30. I was driving home, and the next thing I remembered consciously, I was not on the road. I was sitting behind a church, looking up at the sky at this huge UFO that was over my car. And then just instantly, it just went so fast. It, in a blink of an eye, it was gone. It was dark. It was uh, just pitch black outside. And it was time for me to go back and get my mom, which would have made it approximately 11.30. So from sometime between 5 and 11.30, what seemed to be just a couple of minutes to me, that much time had lapsed. Under hypnosis, Kathy was able to fill in that missing time in horrifying and graphic detail. I remember being on a table. The entity I remember is very, very tall. The face was exactly like a praying mantis. And it moved its head in very jerky-like manner. And I'm pretty sure, just in my own heart, that that's not the first time in 1965. I think it was very upsetting to her what she was experiencing, re-experiencing under hypnosis, and decided that was it, no more. But Debbie continued to probe her abduction experiences, recalling events from childhood. And soon, a pattern of experience developed that she believes explains why she was forced to endure painful and humiliating experimentation. Debbie's bizarre odyssey was only just beginning. Her family searched for a reason why the intruders had chosen them after this. Next, Debbie White's terrifying repressed memory of her alien abduction. I assumed they were telling me I was this child's mother. By 1985, Debbie Jordan and her sister, Kathy Mitchell, were in the middle of a nightmarish series of experiences they could not explain. At first, they tried to see the alien intruders as a dream or a hallucination infecting their minds. The possibility that the intruders were real was too difficult to face. Bud Hopkins' three-year investigation concluded that the White family of Indianapolis had had a 30-year relationship with extraterrestrial forces, Hopkins dubbed the intruders. And when daughter Debbie was hypnotized and regressed back to earlier alien encounters, she revealed the sinister purpose behind the family's chain of abduction experience. What you are about to hear are the actual tapes from her hypnotherapy sessions. Something's not right. Okay, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? I was being squashed. Squashed? Yeah. 
heart, the whole body. And my stomach. Your stomach. I felt as if somebody had taken my insides and just ripped me open inside, and I could feel pulling, something pulling out of me, and this little tiny thing that looked like a, a, a mouse with no skin on it, like a baby mouse, war, squirming around, squirming around in their hand. No! <laughs> crying out in pain, emotional pain, that her child is being taken from her. When this came up with Debbie, and she finally said to me that she had been pregnant and that the baby had disappeared, I realized that this was pretty important in this case. This is the first case that let us understand uh, the sexual reproductive purpose, and now we see it as central, as absolutely the, the focus of the whole thing. It was the first case, but not the last. Hopkins received correspondence from hundreds of other abductees who all told the same story. And Hopkins came to believe that the reason for the abductions was to create hybrids, half human, half alien beings. I remember being in this place. There were several of these gray things in this room. And holding their hands was a very small little person who didn't look like them. She had tufts of white cottony hair sticking out of her head all over. Really large eyes, but human, blue. When I thought, oh, I'd love to hug you, and she got this panic look on her face, her eyes got huge, and she darted behind one of them, like she was scared to death of me, and I'm, I felt real sad. I asked if I could take her home with me, and he told me, no, she couldn't survive with me. I assumed they were telling me that I was this child's mother. In 1993, Debbie had a hysterectomy, and immediately after the operation, her abduction experiences ended abruptly. But her two children, now grown, continue to have experiences of their own, and Debbie's new husband, Dave, recently discovered a new scoop mark on his shin. That was another very important uh, discovery uh, that I made in that case which, of course, accompanies this idea of some kind of genetic experimentation, because you're going to be doing that sort of thing across generations. The theories about why a hybrid race is being created, they're all over the map, but, but they, they tend to run to the idea that the aliens have reached some kind of evolutionary dead end and need to revivify their own species. Debbie and her sister Kathy recently collaborated on a book detailing their very personal encounters. For both of them, choosing to make their experiences public was a difficult decision. I just felt like it's time. Maybe it's just time to, to just do this and get it out in the open. And so right at the very last minute, the publisher called me and wanted to know if I would use my real name. I said, well, sure. I have to use my real face. Might as well use my real name. Coming forward and revealing their true identities has not been without a price. Although the White family is committed to the reality of alien abduction, not everyone sees their revelations as sincere. Theirs is an incredible tale beyond scientific proof. I don't expect people to believe any of the stuff that me or any of my family members tell them. Believe me, if I hadn't seen some of this stuff with my own eyes, there's no way I would have believed any of it, you know? All we know is something weird is going on, and it's happening to a lot of people, and, and people should uh, stop and think twice about it. It could happen to you. Although Debbie Jordan has not felt the presence of an intruder since 1992, she continues to counsel abductees and their families as a member of Bud Hopkins' Intruders Foundation. <laughs> 